Welcome back to Drum Room Rescue, my series where I take you through the design and construction of my own drum room renovation. Uh, last week we looked at the results. How did we do in terms of acoustic isolation? And then this week I thought maybe I'd just walk you through a few things. These are things that uh, I designed or sort of arranged and configured in a model and in AutoCAD uh, and just take a look at how they turned out uh, here at the drum room. Uh, the thing I want to talk to you about here is this is the heat recovery ventilator. You might recall in the episode on heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Uh, here it is in the flesh and installed. So you may recall what this actually does is provide ventilation to the drum room. When you're looking at acoustic isolation, you're really having to do with mass, with ceiling, and essentially with isolation, or that's you know essentially why you're building a room within a room. Uh, when you do all of that, the challenge that you can often have is not only how am I heating it and air conditioning it, uh, but how I'm ventilating it. So what I actually used is a dedicated outside air system, uh, which is this heat recovery ventilator. Uh, and what this box actually does is it exchanges air inside of the drum room with fresh air from outside. So here, this is the exhaust. Uh, air is drawn from the drum room through heat exchanger, exhausted to the exterior. Uh, fresh air is brought uh, from outside into the heat recovery ventilator and then it's exchanged with the air leaving. Uh, there's a tempering or a transfer of energy uh, so that the, the air that is actually delivered into the drum room uh, isn't the extreme of whatever outside is, either very hot or very cold. Um, and what's kind of nice with this is it's, it's pretty quiet um, and I have it on a separate control uh, that actually has three options. One, you can just turn it on, kind of a medium speed. The second is you can do it so that it turns on out of every hour, it runs for 20 minutes, which is nice to give sort of a refresh to the space that, uh, you know, once you're in there for a while. Uh, and then another is high speed. So why don't we run it through those, those three uh, and we'll see how that looks. Well, as you may be able to hear right now, uh, the unit is running. Uh, it's kind of running in its standard speed. Uh, and like I said, it's exchanging the air inside the drum room with the air outside. Um, inside the garage, it's not a very loud uh, piece of equipment. Uh, and it's definitely, you'll kind of hear it once we go inside. Um, it's pretty good inside the drum room as well. And I think a lot of that has to do with the baffle boxes. And we'll talk about the baffle boxes here in a second. Um, so this is kind of medium speed. Let's look at what it looks like when it's on high speed. Now you may be able to hear, obviously the machine now is a little bit louder. Uh, we're running at high speed. Uh, and so you're getting a lot more air changes per hour inside the drum room space. Um, and again, here in the garage, you know, you can notice it if you're in here doing something. But I think you would notice probably somebody banging away on the drums inside more uh, than this. Uh, and then inside the drum room, it's, it's even at high speed, it, you can barely hear it. Uh, and that really, I think, has to do with not only the isolation from the wall assemblies, uh, but then also the contribution of the baffle boxes. So let's take a look at the baffle boxes. So here are the baffle boxes. Now you may recognize this from uh, the episode I did on sort of planning and some of the planning tools where I talked about really what the purpose of the baffle boxes were. Uh, and, um, you know, how I intend to construct them, well, here they are in the flesh. Um, and as you can see, uh, with their custom purple paint job, they kind of stick out uh, here in the garage. Um, but what you can't see in uh, the installation is what's inside here. So essentially, and we went over this quite a bit in the previous episode, uh, was that these essentially allow an indirect path uh, for air to either be taken out of the space or have air supplied to the space. Um, the box here uh, is, this box is for uh, exhaust, exhausting the air from the drum room. Uh, and this box right here, this is for supplying air to the drum room. Uh, and as you can see, the ductwork sort of connects in the same position. Then it goes through its baffle box sort of maze uh, and then the, the plenum, either the intake plenum or the supply plenum, uh, is at the end of each baffle box. Uh, so what you have here is you have two sheets of drywall. 
that are um, screwed off on a plywood box. Uh, inside the plywood box, you have a one inch fiberglass, rigid fiberglass insulation. Uh, and then you actually have some, um, some uh, weed fabric that's used to kind of keep the fibers from the fiberglass um, in place. Uh, and like I said, it's a circuitous path. So as air, say for example, here, is dr this is the exhaust uh, box, uh, getting from here to eventually way at the top of the box here uh, are a series of baffles. So the air has to make probably in total about six or seven 90 degree turns uh, before it makes its way either into the HRV uh, or out of the HRV. So that does a couple things. One is it allows us to have a hole effectively or two holes in the drum room. That's for the supply air and the exhaust air. Uh, and that allows us to treat those holes so that you are minimizing the escape of sound or sound coming in via those holes. So if you can imagine, just like air has to do quite a bit to get in or out of those baffle boxes, sound has to do the same thing. And inside the baffle box, are materials, acoustic materials like fiberglass insulation that help abate or attenuate that sound uh, as it travels through as well. The second thing is that it also uh, minimizes essentially the, the sound transfer from the heat recovery ventilator itself, the fan, the fan noise and all that stuff. That noise once generated by the heat recovery ventilator, um, it goes through insulated flexible ductwork it goes to the baffle box, there's attenuation, uh, and essentially that reduces the uh, noise from the actual unit getting into the space. Um, so here they are in the flesh, um, and uh, you know, they're pretty static elements essentially, uh, but inside there, that's kind of where all the magic happens. So here in the drum space, uh, the outlet for the baffle boxes is, is pretty small. You have these 16-inch uh, grills at high level. I designed it so that you know, you're exhausting from essentially the drummer area. That's where all the nasty odor comes from. Uh, and then you're supplying back over here uh, near the other side of the room. And that also works nicely with the split system here. Um, the way these systems work is they draw return air directly from the space uh, above uh, and then they discharge uh, via those louvers there, um, different patterns depending on whether it's heating or cooling and you can obviously set those up. We also have my little plaque here. So you know you spend two months building your new space, why not commemorate it with a uh, custom little plaque? So it's, uh, it's perhaps a little nerdy but it's kind of cool. But I call this the uh, drum room control center. So you've got your three lights, your kind of overhead lights, your track light behind the drums, and then your disco lights. This is the actual how you turn on the, the uh, heat, heat recovery ventilator, and then that's separate from the air conditioning. So you got these, these are set up so you can actually, um, via your phone, there's an app, you can adjust temperatures in here, or schedules, or those pieces. So as you recall in the episode we did on doors, we talked a lot about um, sort of the couple of steps in determining how you were going to approach doors for your project. Really looking at the door configuration, the door material, uh, and then essentially how you're sealing a door. So this is the finished project product here. Um, as you can see, we installed those solid core doors. Uh, we also had a design approach where we were going to use freezer hardware. And I can't claim to have come up with this. I really want to give a thank you to True Sound Studios on YouTube, uh, who as a person that I saw with this idea, and I basically just stole the idea because I thought it was a great idea. So again, in our situation, uh, we didn't necessarily want to deal with the garage as an anti-room uh, or an airlock or a vestibule. Uh, and I didn't want to do one massive door with like lead sheeting and some of those complications. So the approach we took was to use a double door design, solid core door. These doors are incredibly heavy. <laughs> it was such a pain uh, getting these, these guys installed. Uh, and then, um, you know, using... Uh, 
uh, hardware that uh, would minimize penetrations in the doors themselves. And it's a double do door approach. So here, obviously, this, this hardware is really nice in that you can get a very tight pressure against the seals that are in here, and I'll show you in a sec, uh, and, um, and without putting too many holes or openings in the door itself. So this is how you come in. So you open this door, and like I said, as a double door approach, you have another door uh, that's gonna, uh, you have to go through to get to the space. But the one thing I wanted to sh show you here was that as this is sort of freezer hardware, uh, once you're inside, you know, there's a latching mechanism, which is right here, um, you need a way to get out. So the way that's handled uh, is with these sort of radial buttons here. Uh, I also added a handle here just to help sort of managing closing it because once you pull these tight against the seals, um, it's, it's pretty tough to do. Um, so you're using your freezer hardware, you're in, you got, you've gone through the first door, and then to get it into the second door, you have to repeat the process and then you're actually into the drum room space. So here we are now, we've got both doors open. Remember that we have a room within a room, so we have the outer door, which, which is essentially the, the structure and the framing for that door uh, is on the outer wall. The structure and framing that supports the inner door is on the inner wall. Uh, and here we are in that sort of gap that's between. It's, it's roughly about 10 inches or so of a gap between. Uh, and in that gap, that's kind of really where the magic happens. That has to do with the ceiling, uh, and the threshold, which is here on the bottom. Uh, and if you recall, um, you know, there was a certain manufacturer that I uh, was looking at in terms of installing uh, this hardware. That's sort of this rigid mounted gasketing system. And then there's sort of a secondary seal here. You can see this black material that's all along. Um, I did my own door frames here. Uh, I also did all the door stops uh, and a little bit of the work here that's in between to help seal sort of that airspace that's between uh, the walls here. Um, and uh, you know, this product uh, it seems to be doing quite well, uh, pretty high quality. Um, and it uh, seems to be performing quite well. So if we look at the threshold, uh, you recall that I was looking specifically at a commercial threshold. Um, this is again that same manufacturer that I showed in our episode on doors. Um, this is a purpose designed threshold that is uh, intended to produce a high sound transmission class or a reduction of sound transfer. Uh, between the space, um, and you'll you'll find these uh, in in retail. You'll find these in offices. Uh, really, this is kind of an exterior door threshold. Um, and as you can see, we've got two of them. So you essentially have uh, the hardware, which is really nice of applying pressure, pushing the door against the seals that are here, uh, as well as that threshold. You have your air gap, and then you have all the same stuff over again uh, on the inner door. Um, so essentially, this you know is all about managing this opening. And again, as a dynamic element, you want to be able to get in and out, uh, but you also want to make sure that you have significant mass uh, and that you're sealing this as best you can to try to prevent the doorway from being a an area where sound can either come into your space uh, or leave your space. Well, here we are. Here's the finished product. Um, I'm actually really happy with the way this turned out. Uh, and we went over some of the thinking and some of the approaches here uh, in our planning and design tool episode. Uh, but I thought I'd just kind of show you some of them um, and touch on a few other pieces. Um, obviously, one of the challenges with going with a room within a room uh, is that you're going to lose some real estate. So you may, um, one of the things that I noticed right off the bat was um, obviously on paper, you, you know that everything's coming in in terms of separation, airspace, a new wall, a new ceiling, you know, the walls are closing in on you a little bit, but I definitely feel it. So everything is just a little bit smaller when you come in here. Uh, and it made it a little bit interesting. Obviously on paper, I kind of had an idea of how I was going to lay out my kit and my gear and all my microphones and all that fun stuff. 
but in reality, you know, you're kind of like, ooh. And when, once you put in the acoustic treatment, which is designed to be off the wall uh, for some very specific purposes, um, you know, the walls are closing in on you a little bit. So um, here in the space, um, my intent was to transition from being sort of on the short side of the room in terms of where I have my kit uh, and put myself kind of on the long side of the room. Uh, I thought that it would open up the space um, for playing with others uh, and getting sort of a better sound in terms of recording. Um, so my drum kit is all set up over here. Um, and obviously as the room gets smaller, you're kind of dealing with the ergonomics. Okay, where do I put uh, my mixer? Where do I put my gear? Uh, if I do have other players out here, how do I get, uh, you know, amps mic'd and how do I get that, that those signals into the mixer or into the interface and all that sort of stuff. So um, I've been kind of sort of figuring that out still. And that's been really fun. Uh, and some of the things I'm going to go over here, um, obviously we, we discussed in some of the previous episodes in terms of planning and design, uh, but let's kind of see how they turned out. And, uh, you know, uh, did we do good or <laughs> not so good? Uh, in terms of the room itself, obviously, we've spent a lot of time talking about the approach of three main approaches in terms of acoustic isolation. One is having significant mass, not only in terms of quantity, but in the right location. The second was sealing as much as possible. And the third is uh, essentially separation. So in terms of mass, we went over in previous episodes our approach in terms of uh, having two sheets of drywall on the interior wall, the room within a room, green glue compound in between those layers, uh, insulation in that wall, insulation in the exterior wall, and then and the next sort of step, the sealing step, going through and making sure everything's sealed. Now, it's really hard to see all that, uh, but in the end, what you do see is obviously this new... Uh, this new walls here, this sheetrock finish. Uh, and, you know, in terms of actual finish, I just went with a painted finish. I didn't get too crazy in terms of texturing. I originally was going to do some texturing in here, but um, in the end, I was didn't really think it really needed it. Uh, and I wanted to kind of pick up a little bit of time when I was constructing. So what we have in the space, in summary, is basically what we designed. We, you know, little things like windows went away, little things like the door over there went away, a window that's behind you went away, that old air conditioner. Uh, and here we have the separate wall that forms the inner part or the room within the room part here in the studio. So that's obviously these gray walls and then above here, the ceiling. Um, in terms of finish, we have a painted finish on the walls we talked about. On the floor, I wanted to put in a, a, a luxury vinyl tile product, and that type of flooring has come a long way. Um, you could get all kinds of different types and patterns um, that mimic wood or stone, uh, and this specifically uh, looks like a kind of almost like old scrap wood. So I was actually kind of, I like the fact that it's kind of higgly piggly and it looks different uh, and it looks interesting to me. So I was real happy with that. Uh, and also here, uh, one thing you'll notice if you look around here is I've added a lot of electrical outlets here. And there's actually on two separate circuits. So um, you know, there's a lot of places to plug in amps, other musical equipment, and they're basically all along all the walls. So no matter where you are, you're not very far from a plug. Uh, and obviously, you know, what you don't see that in the kind of the finished product, you see that and it looks good and okay, yeah, I got a wall, but you, you know, behind the scenes, you know, that I essentially had to rewire the entire garage, we moved the electrical distribution panel, redid all the circuits. Uh, you know, obviously change the circuits to add a different air conditioning system uh, and then eventually to add all the outlets. And like I said, specifically in this room, it's actually separated in two separate circuits. Uh, but what it does here in this space is add a lot of convenience uh, in terms of outlets uh, and being able to plug things in and confidently use them without fearing that you're going to pop a circuit breaker. Um, here in terms of lighting, you know, I did a whole episode on lighting and really I think you could sum up my thesis on lighting it, uh, to the fact that it's, it's super subjective. You know, you could do any million things here. So let's, let's, let's see what we got here. I'm going to go completely dark. It's now pitch black. Now we're in the horror movie part. Uh, 
I kept the sort of main lighting uh, for my space that I had previously. Uh, and that is these sort of LED troffers here. These are uh, surface mounted lights. Uh, and you, you might have seen those in the modeling that I did uh, when I did some Revit modeling for the lighting. Uh, and, um, you know, they just give a general good illumination in here, relatively diffuse, relatively soft. Uh, and, um, you know, it's kind of all purpose. You know, that's, you could almost say this is a bit clinical or a bit office-y. I actually, when I play in here, I don't really use these lights that often. Um, they're great for like if I'm um, hooking up equipment or doing stuff, um, you know, but when I'm playing, I don't actually tend to use them. So let's see another light we set up here. Okay, so this other light, um, this is the track light. And you'll recall that on our episode on lighting, it did a lot of different permutations on tracks and track lighting. And you might remember we had renderings where it kind of looked like a museum or an art gallery because there's so many little spotlights everywhere. Um, but I did put one track light and it kind of in the back. And really that was kind of a fun, you know, I, I don't know if you go back and look at that video, I looked at this kind of final design case I called the drummer spotlight where there were a lot of lights basically right on the drums. Uh, and in reality, that's kind of what I did with this track light. This specific track light has four heads uh, and the four heads can be moved uh, independent of each other. Right now, I basically have um, two heads kind of illuminating that back wall uh, and then the rest pointed down on the kit. And I use that a lot. I actually use that quite a bit when I practice because it's just easy to be able to read the sheet music or see what you're doing and all that. Now, here's the other thing I did. So this is, this is uh, heading down the, towards the, the road to vibeness, just a little bit. So let's go dark again, uh, and let's do this one. Okay, so there's there was you got a little bit of vibe there. So back here, I actually put in a ceiling outlet that will allow you um, to put in. Uh, my intent was to put track lighting here. I have a ceiling cloud. Uh, the purpose of this ceiling cloud is for acoustic treatment. Uh, it helps absorb uh, flutter echo, um, and this setup too kind of helps with the bass response. Uh, and actually, I don't know if you can see, but I, uh, I use this to um, also mount my overheads for my drums. Um, but I also put in some uh, strip LED type uh, lighting. Um, and this lighting can change any number of colors. Um, or anything so if you're feeling really froggy one day and you're like you know what i want to just drum to some uh some purple uh, that's, how, that's how i'm feeling i'm feeling purple uh, and then it's got another setting which i call um i call the disco mode so this thing actually has like a microphone in it and if i talk or make noise it, it's actually responsive uh to whatever uh, is going on. So the, the lights react to the sound. So that's kind of standard. I think a lot of these strip LEDs, but it actually makes it kind of cool. I had a jam in here uh, last weekend uh, and I was, I was showing the guitar. So I said, well, let's just turn on the disco lights. And so we, uh, you know, once you close that back door, the doors, it is pitch black in here. There's literally no light in here. Uh, and so when you're playing, this is going on. So. Uh, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of got, it's got a bit of vibe. It's kind of cool. You know, it's not as clinical, uh, as, as just those overhead lights. Uh, but most of the time I just kind of keep these in a, uh, sort of a, either a, like a green or a blue kind of setting. But sometimes I practice with just those on, uh, which is kind of nice. Um, it's kind of an interesting little thing to do. So in terms of acoustic treatment, um, I think last week I touched on it a little bit in terms of what its goals are, um, but that is an entire science of its own. Um, you know, people make a living out of being acousti acousticians, uh, and there's all these concepts like absorption and um, diffusion, 
Uh, and there are, you, you, you can go really go down the rabbit hole in terms of acoustic treatment, especially uh, with um, spaces that are de you're designing for specific purposes like a live room or a studio or a listening position for mixing. Uh, and so, you know, what I want to do is just very basic stuff. And I can't actually take credit for this design. Um, nowadays, a lot of the companies that sell um, acoustic treatment products uh, offer a service where they will do some free design advice. And I contacted a company. I'll put a link in the description. Uh, kind of a smaller company out of Nashville. And just, you know, here's my 160 square foot box. I'm a drummer. Uh, I want just some basic um, uh, kind of approaches to kind of make it less lively, but not, not totally lively. And... Um, you know, it's not meant to be like a recording studio. It's really small and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, so I reached out to them and they, you know, gave some advice. Uh, and, you know, they have products I could have bought, but the lead times are really long. Uh, the products themselves, you know, I guess if you, if you didn't have any sort of carpentry skills or access to tools, uh, or maybe you were just a little nervous to get into that, um, you know, it might be cost effective, but for the most part, you can build basic acoustic treatment yourself. And again, I don't claim to be an acoustician uh, or have any sort of in-depth knowledge in that sense. Uh, but the free advice that I was given specific to this room was just about, you know, taking out some of the echo, leaving a little bit of lively sound and for basic recording just tracking stuff for fun, which is pretty much what I do <laughs> all the time. Um, so let's talk about these panels. Um, so what you have here, uh, this is a two by four frame uh, that's just a construction screwed together with some glue. Uh, and in inside the frame, what's two by four, which is nominal dim dimension. So the four part is actually three and a half inches, but you have a three inch uh, safe and sound, mineral rules. So you've got two by four frame, mineral rules inside of it, three inches. On the back side, you have some of that weed barrier that I used in the baffle boxes. Um, that's just, again, kind of hold it. Uh, and then the front here, um, there are sort of different approaches in terms, you know, obviously there's aesthetics. You know, you want, if you want specific colors or patterns or something on here. Uh, but there's a couple of different companies that are kind of famous for fabric that's good in terms of acoustic performance. What you want here is something that they call acoustically transparent. Uh, I mean, if you put something that was highly reflective here, you know, you're not allowing those sound waves to get into the material so that it can attenuate or treat. Um, it literally becomes a game of ping pong off the panel itself. Um, so there's a, there's a kind of like a very famous fabric that's used in a lot of panels, but it is very expensive. Uh, and so I didn't go that route, um, but this is a, a different fabric that I researched that um, has a good performance, but was much more cost effective and I had never heard of it, called duck cloth or duck canvas. Uh, I, I don't frequent a lot of fabric stores. I've only been twice in my life. Uh, and the second time I went to get this stuff, I went up to the, the gal that was working. I said, do you have duck cloth? Expecting her to say, huh? And she was like, yeah, let me show you. So I, it's a common thing, I guess. Anyway, uh, it kind of has like that rough feel. It kind of feels like you'd make like a bag out of it or you make like pants or something out of it. You know, it's kind of got that feel. Um, so this literally just kind of holds in the, uh, the mineral wool, and then obviously provides a little bit of aesthetic, a better, nicer looking finish. Uh, but one of the things I did and I've done previously, I've made panels before, uh, is I just used little cork uh, to keep the panel off the wall. Um, and if you dig into the information, um, the deeper the panel up to a point, the better it is in terms of record, uh, attenuating or absorbing bass frequencies or low frequencies. And another thing that you can do to help with that uh, is in introducing an air gap behind the panel. Um, so that also helps in terms of absorbing bass frequencies. And that's one of the things, and again, I'm not an acoustician and there's an entire science behind this, but uh, what you're dealing with with a drum kit is you have a pretty wide frequency response, right? 
if we were playing a bass guitar, and it kind of depends on where you are on the neck, uh, but it kind of lives in a sort of frequency band. Um, you know, so you can sort of treat and, and isolate the certain things that you're trying to do. Uh, a drum kit is made up of a bunch of different instruments. Um, each of them have a little bit of a different frequency response, very high frequency cymbals, uh, all the way down to the relatively low frequency, which would be like the kick drum, the bass drum. So uh, one of the frequencies that's the most difficult to deal with, not only in terms of treatment, but also in terms of attenuation or isolation, uh, is those low frequency bass response. So really uh, what these panels are trying to do is kind of even out the reverb in the space uh, and then also kind of attenuate some of those bass frequencies because if you get too many bass frequencies kind of stacking up on each other, just everything starts to get muddy. You know, you're, you're not getting a clean recording. And you may or may not hear it in my voice, but I actually uh, put in a uh, storage rack here in this space. I intended to put one in, uh, but, you know, I waited to the very end till everything in here was done. Uh, and there's a little bit of an echo. I don't know if it even comes through. Uh, but I have a couple of drums on there, including a couple of snares uh, and some toms and stuff like that. Uh, and, you know, you have all this absorption and diffusion and then essentially you have this uh, echo creator here uh, on your storage rack. But, you know, again, I, I don't think it really matters in a hill of beans anyway. So if we're looking on this side of the drum room, this is obviously opposite the drum kit. Uh, you know, the, some decent space here for other players. I just had a jam session last week. Uh, I had set it up for three other people, um, but we only had one. Um, I do think the room would get a little tight with three people in here. Uh, it's a little bit better, obviously, when the doors are closed. And there's plenty of outlets and spaces to put an amp and do all that sort of stuff. Uh, but, um, you know, it was... Pretty nice having you know the guitarist out here. I'm kind of back in the corner and everything like that. So here, obviously, uh, one of the things that I went over quite a bit uh, is this is the uh, split type system here that's used for heating and air conditioning. Uh, and you may have seen it in my um, project journals, uh, but there was a minor design issue here, uh, which I actually noticed. I didn't notice on paper when I was thinking about it. Or, or laying things out. But I definitely thought about it later as I was kind of doing some stuff and I'm like, wait a minute. And that is that the, uh, you know, this will come up in my sort of lessons learned video. I've got a couple I'm working on and I hope to put that together relatively soon. Uh, and I think this is a common thing. I'll bring it up now because it's kind of funny and you can a little bit learn at my expense right now, uh, is that, you know, you always got to think in three dimensions and that's, it's not, You'll get there after a while, um, and I still to this day don't always remember that, you know, you're so used to looking at sort of a 2D plan set, and in your head you're thinking about things, but, um, you know, realizing that this door is 80 inches tall, we've just dropped the ceiling six inches, uh, this thing, you know, you've got to get certain, you want to try to achieve certain clearances um, between the ceiling and the, the unit, and all of a sudden, what happens? These two things are right at each other, okay? Um, so that was a relatively quick fix with a door stop. So like that, the door stops. So you don't get the full door opening, um, but you know, you get it 90% of the way. Um, but this here are the storage racks I talked about. Uh, and you know, it's nice to have a place to put um, things you're not using. Drums are one of those things where you, I mean, I personally have a couple of cymbals. I got another floor tom and things that I, I don't generally use, I guess, unless I, I, I want to try a different sound or I'm messing with something. Uh, and the real estate of the room has kind of gotten a little smaller. So, um, you know, I don't have all this stuff on my kit at the same time. So you want a cl nice clean way or nice clean area. You can keep that stuff. Uh, and so it was nice to kind of fit in a rack here. Um, you know, you lose a little bit of floor space and it, it kind of pained me because it's really hard to find uh, racks that are really small that aren't uh, flimsy, right? You know, I'm looking for like a four foot rack that just don't exist, don't exist. Uh, or if they do, 
they're like eight feet tall um, and obviously you know clearance issues in here and the air conditioner and I really tried to get a rack to kind of sit nicely in this little space here uh, but that didn't quite work out so we got kind of one of these bigger racks um, that you know it's again it's a really nice place to just kind of temporarily put things uh, and if I want to take a different the floor tom out and put it on the kit um, obviously that it's right here and it's a little bit of gymnastics over in the drum area but um, pretty easy to do so